Can you guys hear me now? Can you hear me at this point? Anything? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. Jess says that she can hear me. Mark, can you hear me? I know. It's a pain. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I don't know what's going on with this particular microphone this evening. You're hearing it in Mandarin. Well, that would be really interesting because honestly, I speak Cantonese, Thomas, so I'm surprised that you're hearing it in Mandarin. All right, Mark, what's going on? Jeremy, oh, there's the book boss right there, man. He's joining me tonight, so I need to be up on my game tonight if I got the book boss on board. Pat, you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Man, guys, just when I think I've like got everything good, I got my, my, my drink in my cup, I'm actually kind of not rushing to start the show tonight, my prom decides not to work. I know, I know, Mark, what can I say? What can I say? All right, guys, let's start this show up again. Let's start it right. Let me know, I'm, I'm hearing all the shout outs here. Uh, those of you who are watching the replay, please put in hashtag replay. Uh, I just like to kind of keep track to see who's watching live and who's watching the replay so I can track the comments and answer any questions that come in afterwards. Tom in Wichita, Kansas, feeling positive. I like that. All right, guys, well, actually, I would think you're in the negatives right now. Holy cow, it's cool. It's cold, people. It's like in, I had to cover my plants today. It's Florida, and it's going to be in the 30s tonight. We got Johnny V from Poughkeepsie, New York, and the Cozy Talks house. What's up, Johnny? I love how Johnny always makes an entrance. We got Tom McIntyre on board. Ashley, got your sweet tea tonight. Girl, it's going to be cold where you're at, too. We got Julie from Northern Ireland. Oh, my goodness. Welcome, Julie. Thank you for staying up. I know it's a little late where you are. Guys, give me a shout out. Let me know who you are, where you're from, what's in your coffee mug. For those of you who are new to the Cozy Talk Show, that's kind of your hazing ritual. That's how I like to get to know folks. Uh, let's see, we got Jeffrey. Oh, I got a second test socket. Went great. Walk in the next week. Yes. Awesome, Jeffrey. Having tea. We've got Susan. She's live. Six, negative 16. Holy smokes. Lori Gold, AK, first time viewing. Lori, thank you so much for watching. And you'll get to see, uh, I love to interact with my audience, Lori. So if you have any questions, don't be shy. Start posting them in the comments section. We got Glenda in Seattle with her hot cocoa. I should have done the hot cocoa tonight, Linda. We got Lynette with her hot apple cider and Jody from Las Vegas in 68 degrees. Jody, <laughs> you're going to make people jealous. And then Charles can hear me live. Thank you, Charles. Casey in good old North Carolina sipping the Dr. Pepper. We got Jim in Illinois with the Guinness. Ooh, got some good drinks on tonight. There's Barbara in Connecticut with her green tea. Jess in Madison, Wisconsin. We got a full compliment on board tonight, guys. And guys, I'm a happy PT because I got lots of questions that y'all submitted this week. And that makes me a very happy physical therapist. So for those of you who are watching for the first time, welcome. My name is Kosi Bayoso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in not so warm Tampa, Florida. I've been a PT now for 18 years, Jeez. 18 years at this. And I have a wonderful practice here in Florida. It's called Palanca and it is specifically dedicated for working with amputees and, and loving, loving, loving what I'm doing. Big plans this year, lots of projects that I'm getting ready to launch. So, so excited to be able to eventually share that with you guys. All right, guys. So we had, and I want to take a moment to uh, thank a couple people, uh, Tom and Steven. You guys have been so wonderful about sending me some really thoughtful emails on topics that you guys would like to um, discuss on the show and sharing your input with me. Guys, you can email me. You can find that on my website. There's a little place where you can uh, send me an email through there. You can send me messages through Facebook, through Instagram to send me your questions, send me the topics you would like to hear discussed on this show. This show is for you, the Limb Loss community. And whatever skills that I have that can possibly answer your questions and help you out, they are here at your service. So take advantage of that. Ask the questions. All right, guys. So let's go to the first uh, uh, first thing. This is actually a question that I picked up from some of the support groups because I actually saw uh, two or three different folks on different platforms uh, discussing this. Uh, and it says, this one came from Olga. It says, my therapist has never worked with someone who has a sea leg. And she keeps telling me that I have to keep my thigh and butt tight and pushed back to keep the knee from bending. Isn't that only for a manual knee? Am I wrong? No, Olga, you are not wrong. You are absolutely correct. And then the other couple support groups that I saw this evening or this past week, there was a lot of chitter chatter about the differences between mechanical and microprocessor knees. And unfortunately, some of you had problems 
that your therapist didn't know the difference. Okay. So guys, this is a way to kind of have a conversation with your therapist. If you're working with a physical therapist, you know, uh, you can bring this information to them. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the differences we've got. I did a show. Um, I've done a show completely on mechanical knees. And after that, after the show is over, I'll post that link on this show. So if you guys want to refer back to it, where I explain all the different kinds of mechanical knees out there. Okay. And then we have our microprocessor units. Now, different manufacturers have different microprocessor needs. Uh, Freedom Innovations has the PLEA 3. Uh, let's see, Oser. Oser has, is, is very well known for its Rio. Autobach, it's known for its C Leg and the Genium series. We have Blatcher, they have the Orion and the Link system. And guys, I know I'm missing stuff. I know I'm missing stuff. So, what is the difference? What is the difference? For the most part, and this is a real general umbrella. Uh, explanation and description. A microprocessor unit functions like a hydraulic knee. Okay. So it's got a hydraulic unit. Again, every manufacturer has things a little bit differently. Okay, guys, this is just in general how it works. Okay. The microprocessor unit is the little computer in that knee that takes information with all the sensors. It takes information from the environment. It measures to see at what angle is your hip and your knee at, and it adjusts that hydraulic fluid. It adjusts the friction in the knee, okay? So I, I always have a tough time trying to come up with a, an analogy that can really kind of explain to folks the difference between a mechanical knee and a microprocessor knee, okay? And this is the best way I could do. Y'all know those revolving doors that you'll see in the nice fancy hotels, right? Those revolving doors that love to catch my skirt and make a fool out of me when I'm trying to go out and around them, okay? Some of them are manual, meaning you have to push that revolving door to get it to move. Some of them are automatic. I find those to be even trickier, right? They're moving on their own. You still have to do the timing correctly, right, to get into the revolving door, and you still have to keep moving and do the work, right, to make sure you don't make a fool out of yourself, but there's that component where it's doing some of that movement for you, okay? That's the difference between a microprocessor knee and a mechanical knee, okay? The microprocessor knee is a mechanical knee with just a little computer added on, okay? And here's some of the common misconceptions. And I get this both from therapists and from uh, end users, from patients. Everybody seems to think that when you put on a microprocessor knee, that boom, you're just gonna take off walking for the next 20 miles and that the leg is gonna do all the work for you. That's not the case, okay? Like I said, when you have that automated revolving door, right? You just can't walk willy nilly into it, right? You still have to watch your timing to make sure you don't go smacking your forehead on the revolving door. And then once you're inside the revolving door, you have to do the work to keep up with the movement, right? Same thing with the microprocessor knee guys. You need to know how to do the timing, okay? You need to know how to take those steps, how to activate it, and how to keep moving in order to really utilize the full potential of a microprocessor knee. A lot of times I'll get folks coming into my clinic and they've transitioned from a mechanical knee with what they were very efficient with a mechanical knee and they were doing, they were independent, doing some really high level activities. They'll come in to see me with the microprocessor knee and they're still walking with the same kind of gait pattern that they were using with the mechanical knee. And I'm like, shoot, that's like taking a Ferrari and just, you know, driving it in first gear, right? Let's ring this puppy out, okay? So a lot of times when I have patients who are transitioning, we do need to go back to the basics, some of the gait foundation, gait training foundation basics. And I've got quite a few videos of those. Actually, if you go, you know what, I'm going to type that in. <laughs> Mission Gate. If you guys go to YouTube and type in Mission Gate Cosi, okay, you're gonna find you're gonna find a whole thing of foundational gate training videos. And I give that to my mechanical knees, my microprocessor knees, my below the knees, my bilaterals. Everybody gets these foundational exercises. So a lot of times with that transition, you need to go back to the foundation because you have to get to know this knee. Okay, so Olga, okay, your therapist was telling you that when your heel hit the floor, that you had to pull back to lock the knee. That's how a mechanical knee works. Why? Because there's no, you know, there's nothing in that knee to tell it to stop. So your muscles have to be the one to, to put the brakes on. 
okay? When you're using the microprocessor knee and your heel hits the ground, you can actually have just a little bit of flexion in your knee. Let me see if I can get Bob to behave himself and help him demonstrate. <laughs> Bob, he gets no respect around here. All right, Bob, come on, help me out. All right, so guys, here's our foot, right? So when we take a step with the mechanical knee, right? This isn't working. Your heel hits the ground and you have to pull back to make sure that that knee is locked. Otherwise, right, that mechanical knee is gonna go busting out on you, right? With the microprocessor knee, when your heel hits the floor, I don't know if you guys can appreciate that, your knee, let me put it on the red so you can see it, your knee can actually be just a little bit bent, just a tiny bit, it's only five degrees. Okay, and the friction in that knee and the microprocessor knee is going to prevent it from collapsing. Okay, and that's actually, depending on the literature that you look at, some literature will say that your knee is fully extended when your heel hits the floor. Some literature will say that there's a little bit of a flexion in there when your knee hits the floor. Okay, so that's what part of what that microprocessor knee is going to help in doing. And that's one of the big, big, big differences in using a microprocessor knee compared to a mechanical knee. Other things that you're gonna find is there's things like stumble and stance recovery um, features in a lot of, and pretty much now all of these microprocessor knee units. So meaning when you stub your toe on accident, your prosthetic toe, instead of the, the knee collapsing on you, right? And you hitting the floor, it'll kind of lock and it'll give you just that split second that you need to catch your pace and catch yourself before you fall down. And it has a whole other slew of bells and whistles. And again, every manufacturer has its own set of bells and whistles and what they do that's very unique to that knee, okay? But that's probably one of the big differences. And guys, those of you who, those of you who are working with physical therapists who are not amputee specialists, okay? One thing that you can encourage your physical therapist is to have a conversation with your prosthetist. Guys, I've been doing this for 18 years and I still have to pick up the phone and call either the prosthetist or one of the sales reps or one of the prosthetists that works um, with one of the manufacturers just so I can get the specifics on a particular foot, on a particular knee, on a particular liner, on a particular suspension system. There's so much technology here, guys, that it's hard to know about all of it. Okay. So, for any PTs out there who are listening or any of you who are bringing this to your PTs, there is no shame in calling that prosthetist or calling the sales rep that makes that particular knee and asking them, hey, how does this knee work? What do I need to take into consideration when I'm working on the gait training with my patient? Okay, the gait training mechanics are the same, right? Human gait training, human gait mechanics has not changed since caveman days, okay? But how we teach the person with the mechanical knee and the microprocessor knee can be just a little bit different. Let me see if I can't. Woo, lots of comments that just came in. Holy smokes, folks. All right. We got, oh, Wendy came in on board. We got Olga. Okay, great, Olga, you were on board. Okay. Um, hey, guys, I'm just scrolling through these comments. Bear with me for just a moment. Hey, Julie, glad you could be here. <laughs> Thomas says, you had to stabilize the knee and extension back when you used a crank on your car. <laughs> Showing your age there, Thomas. <laughs> All right. Olga says, I switched to another PT who has worked with an MPK and she had me up and walking on a walker in 20 minutes. And guys, here's a dirty little secret. When I was first training 18 years ago and I was a freshly licensed physical therapist, the C leg had just come out on the market, which means we didn't get to see it for a long time, right? At that time, only the, uh, the military veterans at Walter Reed were using the C leg. So I grew up teaching all of my patients how to walk on mechanical knees. And the first time I had a microprocessor knee, I, I was kind of wigging out. I was like, I, I don't know how to use this thing. I don't know. And I, don't, I was already a well-experienced therapist by this point. And I remember calling my mentor going, Curtis, I got the real knee. I don't, I don't know what's going on. He was just laughing at me. And he walked me through it. And then I was able to talk to the rep um, from Oser who makes the real knee. 
And it was, it was a beautiful thing. I mean, learning how to use it, it was, it was just an amazing thing to be able to teach a patient how to use it. And it's just minor tweaks here and there that you have to do with your gait training program. Uh, Thomas says, a mechanical knee is like a car with one gear. A hydraulic knee is a two-speed that can be tricked. <laughs> a microprocessor knee is like putting a modern transmission into your car. Oh, okay. I like that car analogy, Thomas. Uh, let's see. Marshall says, I was lucky and started walking with a Rio 3 knee, now using a C leg. Hey, Steven. Hey, Harsh. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes, Thomas, thank you for that part. It said, Thomas says, it doesn't, the microprocessor need doesn't give your engine more power. That's what the physical therapist does. I like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, Jeff, I appreciate that. And guys, for any physical therapists out there who are watching this show, um, it, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to do this show. I know there's not a whole lot of folks out there, not a lot of amputee training out there for us as clinicians. Um, so, and I did have, I actually have a question from a physical therapist that I'm, uh, that I'm working on tonight, I'll be sharing tonight. Uh, let's see, Susan asks, have I been a PT for 18 years with amputees? N yes and no, Susan. So the beauty about my profession, and one of the things that uh, attracted me to the profession of physical therapy was that we do everything. We do everything from head to toe. Um, you know, on my resume, I have, you know, I've worked, uh, I actually started off as a pediatric physical therapist. Uh, I worked in pretty much every ICU imaginable. So cardiac, trauma ICU, burn RCU, orthopedic ICU, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, transplant units, infectious disease, like anywhere in a hospital, you will find a physical therapist there. Um, even had a couple of times to go into the OR. And sometimes when we had overflow in the hospital, the physical therapist would go and do some, some uh, work in the ER as well, okay? So as a physical therapist, you have to train in all those different specialties. And this includes guys, so your acute care, inpatient rehab, outpatient, home health settings, right? And I was very, very, very fortunate to train in a hospital that basically threw me into every single one of those settings, okay? So I would see amputees everywhere throughout that, right? Because sometimes amputees are not just amputees, they're also spinal cord injury patients. It could be an amputee who had a stroke. It could be an amputee who became an amputee due to burn injuries, okay? So I spent a lot of my career rotating around all of these specialties. And yes, definitely my focus when I moved here into Tampa and started my family, my focus became purely amputees. And that's why I opened up my clinic so I could just keep the focus there. Um, but all of that training that I received in all of those different specialties is what helps me so much now. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about that when I uh, am doing some of the gait training with my patients, oftentimes I'm using some of the same techniques that I used when I work with stroke patients, okay? And even some of the developmental techniques that I used with pediatric patients, I can apply them uh, to working with my amputee patients. So a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, Susan. Um, but yes, amputees have been a part of my career since the beginning. And it's something that I've always, always loved to do. Oh, Ashley, thank you. It's one of my favorite vintage blouses. Thank you. All right, let's see. All right. Oh, Steven, that's very kind. <laughs> Susan. Susan, I gotta read this. I gotta chuckle a little bit. My prosthetist works directly with the head of amputee specialist right at a PT hospital. He's good, but he thinks he knows everything. And you know, let's face it, you find that in any profession. <laughs> um, oh, Lori, I'm so happy to hear that. Lori says, I didn't, I didn't have a therapist and I found you on the Mission Gate channel. When I finally got a therapist, she was very surprised how well I was doing on my own. Thank you. I transitioned from a mechanical to a microprocessor and I'm just having trouble with endurance. Guys, just a quick cozy poll. How many of you had to do that transition from mechanical to microprocessor? And how many of you went back to using a mechanical knee? That's what I wanna know. Let's see, lots of great comments here. Casey says, veteran here and very lucky to have the Audubon X3. Well, thank you for your service, Casey. <laughs> oh, thank you, Gerard. What didn't I do? Well, they kind of kicked me out of the OR at one point. I think I was getting a little too cheeky there. Uh, let's see. No, Susan, not so much knowledgeable, just lots of experience. There's, there's, a, there's a saying in Spanish. It doesn't translate very well, but there's a saying in Spanish that says, 
the devil knows more because he's old, not because he's the devil. <laughs> so <laughs> everything that I've learned, guys, is just because I've been doing this for 18 years. And believe me, uh, when I look at some of the uh, some of the some of the PTs in my field, my mentors, I mean, wow, they're going to forget more than I will ever learn. Uh, let's see. David, frankly, I treasure starting with a mechanical knee before I moved to a microprocessor knee. I learned some critical basics first, strength, stamina, balance, confidence, gait. Moving to a microprocessor knee was a little easier, but it still involves work. Yes, yes. And that's definitely something. So Brett started out with a micro. Linda Cola started out with a mechanical, and then she transitioned to the microprocessor. Uh, let's see, Jeff. Okay, sounds good, Jeff. Sounds good. Uh, let's see. And Jess says, I've always used mechanical knees starting at age two. And I find that a lot. There's a lot of um, folks who are pediatric amputees, either because of cancer, trauma, or congenital amputations or limb difference. Um, and they start off with those mechanical knees because the children, they just change so quickly in their growth and they're constantly outgrowing knees um, that they will stay on a mechanical knee for several, several years. Um, and, and I see, you know, just, and again, uh, children are just so resilient in that regard. And Jess, I'd love to hear your opinion on this one and how it worked for you. Um, I see that they switch back and forth. Uh, Zach Gowan is actually another really great example of that. Zach Gowan has been on my show a couple of times. He was the first WWE amputee wrestler. Yeah, you can catch his video. Um, I have that in my video archives as well. He was a childhood amputee due to osteosarcoma, and he goes in between his microprocessor, and now currently he's using the capital hydraulic knee by College Park. So between mechanical and microprocessor for him as well. Uh, Jim says, started with a C leg four, got a mechanical knee as an activity lever for use in the water, and I'm then safe getting to and from the water. And I see that a lot too. A lot of folks, well, for certainly for my runners, uh, above the knee runners, they'll use uh, some flavor of mechanical knee and then also for the beach, like some folks have the uh, the higher end uh, microprocessor knees that are water resistant or waterproof and they take them into the water. Other people like to keep those nice and dry and use a mechanical knee for when they go in the water. Okay. Yes, Di Diane, very nice. She said it in Spanish. She's, she got the saying. El diablo sabe de más por viejo que por diablo. The devil knows more because of being old and being the devil. Very good, Diane. I'm impressed. <laughs> Barbara says, Autobach water need to plie three, four months ago. Awesome, but exhausting. Yeah. And again, it, there is a transition there, guys. And I always encourage people, even if you're an experienced walker, uh, whenever you're, you're making a big change like that and, and going from mechanical to mic microprocessor or in the opposite direction, big change. Get yourself some physical therapy tune up everything, get the strengthening done right, because what you don't want is any compensation mechanisms that can then create issues with back problems or with joint problems. Mark, you're so funny. All right, guys, moving on. Uh, here was one, sorry, looking at my cheat sheet here to see where, which one's the next question. Okay, this is one that came in, and, and I thought this was a really fantastic question because we really haven't had discussions about this in depth. And I actually want to hear your hacks on this one, guys. So uh, Steve sent me this email that he read in another, and he read in another uh, support group. And, and I quote, as a man, all said and done, one of the greatest pleasures my now leg brought me is the ability to pee standing again. I was in rehab and taught to accomplish all toilet activities sitting down. And this is not normal for a man, right? And then he goes on to talk about, you know, that as a right above the knee amputee, the socket runs up the back of the thigh, hits the toilet lid when you're trying to sit down, and it makes it very difficult to use the bathroom, both for number one and number two. And the cleanup process is also difficult, okay? Now, and then he goes on to talk about, you know, the issues with having to try to use a public toilet that are, you know, not so clean and slippery floors. Um, and when you're visiting people's homes, right, especially if you're staying overnight, how do you handle showering? How do you handle if you have an adaptive bathroom at home and managing that, okay? And he goes on to say, how important is my toilet? It's so important that I'm selling my home of 32 years to build a place that it can accommodate my needs. And the toilets are my prime area of focus. And guys, it's, 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 
you know, the subject of toileting is not something we discuss usually, as, as, as he says, not something we usually discuss in public society, polite society, but it's something that has to be contended with. OK, and this is where I give a huge shout out to my colleagues, the occupational therapists in the field, because they are the wizards at coming up and teaching people how to maneuver these everyday activities of daily living and how to do it safely and efficiently and with dignity, with dignity. OK, I worked, you know, I mentioned that I worked in spinal cord injury and, and you know, a lot of times when people see a person in a wheelchair who's a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, it's obvious they're not walking, right? They're not going to be ambulatory, right? But what many people don't realize is depending on where that spinal cord has been injured, this person is not using the bathroom on their own and they may not have control over their bladder or their bowels. Think about that, guys. That's really intense. Think about how that would impact your daily life. And what, again, when I was working as a physical therapist early years and working with this particular population and, and just seeing the frustration, the, the embarrassment, right, that goes along with this and having to have other people help you with basic toileting needs, right? So it, even to the point where I would hear sometimes the nurses talking and also some of the patients saying that if they had to choose between the ability to walk again, and the ability to use the toilet normally, they'd want to use the toilet normally. So this is a very real thing. And, and you know, certainly when, when you're working in the hospital with a patient who's just out of surgery, you know, they're still working the anesthesia out of their body. They may be on some heavy duty morphine, basically things that are making them a huge fall risk. As a therapist, your main concern is making sure I don't let this patient fall on that freshly amputated limb Okay. And get myself into some serious trouble, but I still have to teach them how to get to and from the bathroom independently. So yeah, many times with my men, I would say, okay, guys, you guys need to sit down at first, right? Just to make sure we're being safe. Okay. But there are ways to go around that guys. Those of you who are a little bit uh, fresher out of your surgery and you're still kind of trying to find your balance using a walker. Okay. The nice thing is, is these walkers are wide enough that they can fit over a toilet and over the commode. So the man can do his, his uh, urination standing up, okay? Um, the second thing to consider is some of the people, some folks, especially when they're fresh out of that surgery, they're experiencing some severe phantom pain that is triggered by using the bathroom, okay? So in those cases, again, out of the need for safety, the man should probably sit down because if they get that jolt of lightning phantom pain, when they're trying to use the bathroom, you're looking at a disaster situation there. Okay. But after that, you know, after, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I got to read some of these comments because I knew this was going to get some, some good, good conversation going. Uh, let's see. What, Susan says, I installed a tall toilet. When I have to go number two, my leg hurts. Like once I go, my leg stops hurting. Why? And many amputees have this problem. Yes, Susan. And that was something that when we did a show on I did a show on phantom pain in the beginning of December, the first week of December. If y'all want to go back, want to go back and watch that at some point, that's one of the triggers. That was one of the triggers. And I had a, I had one patient in my clinic recently, a you know, young woman. And she said, whenever she had to pee, that phantom pain would just tear through her limbs, something terrible. And it, it subsided over the period of six months. Thank goodness. And for the most part, I hear that that particular phantom trigger subsides with time, but you can see where that can probably cause some problems, okay, when using the toilet. All right, so Jeff says, with socket while on while on toilet, super glue a patch of leather to the socket and toilet will not slide on you when you lean to the right or left. Jeff, I like that. Okay, guys, I'm going to reread that one again out loud. So Jeff says that he uses, he, he keeps the socket on while sitting on the commode. And he says, you can super glue a patch of leather to the socket and on the toilet, and it won't let you slide when you're leaning to the right or to the left. There you go. Jeff says, I'm spending way too much money to remodel the master bathroom prior to my surgery in March. And guys, for me, you know, whenever I, I worked home health for eight years, oh, great, that was a long time. And, you know, the bathroom was the first room of the house that I would go to. I would introduce myself to the patient, introduce myself to the patient's family, and then I'd say, where's your bathroom? 
<laughs> basically it was to rearrange the bathroom with whatever I could at that time in that visit. Okay. Because your home needs to be your safe place. Your home needs to be the place where you don't have to accommodate to your home. Your home is accommodated to you. And this can involve some, you know, expensive, fancy adaptations, or it can be just something as simple as elevating the toilet commode just a little bit. Um, Okay, let me just read through a couple more here. Liz says, as a peer visitor, standing to pee has been a big motivator for guys to get <laughs> use the leg. <laughs> Liz, I agree with you, and, I, and I'm a little ashamed to say that I've used being able to use the bathroom as a motivator to get some of my patients out of bed because, honestly, people would rather go to the bathroom than have to use a bedpan. So, yeah, that was sometimes a motivating factor I would use uh, for my patients to get them up and walking with the walker. Got to do what you got to do, right? All right. Um, yeah. And David says, it's interesting to say the least, especially when you're traveling and visiting friends. So guys, tell me about some of the things that you do when you are visiting friends and you're staying overnight. Um, I know recently I had the, the huge project that I did in November here at my home. And y'all may have seen some of the pictures of that, uh, but it involved bringing in some amputee models, one of whom stayed with me in my home. Uh, and I had to, and it was interesting. It was my first time having an amputee stay overnight at my house. And even as a physical therapist, I was just like, okay, what do I need to do to make this place comfortable and accessible for my patient? So it meant making sure that she had a downstairs bedroom, even though she knows how to go up and downstairs, obviously trying to make it more comfortable and making sure that my shower had in, having an appropriate chair. And thankfully I had a nice sturdy chair and then having crutches for her available. Um, so it, it, it made me certainly appreciate everything that you all have to go through when you're traveling. Um, another thing that, and again, this is just from talking to patients of mine, a lot of my above the knee amputees, uh, when they're sitting down to use the bathroom, they either take off the leg completely, they leave the liner on, but they, and the socks on, but they'll take off the leg and sit down. Or as they're sitting down, they'll just push the socket down enough so it's not clanking on the toilet lid. And then they roll down the liner so that the liner doesn't get soiled. So that, that's just a couple of the, how does it work for a bilateral? And again, Bonnie, this is where an occupational therapist is so valuable with helping with different adaptive devices. So it, a lot of it, Bonnie, will depend upon the, function, the functional mobility of a bilateral. Sometimes with bilaterals, um, if they're not wearing legs yet, they can transfer to the commode the same way a paraplegic will transfer to the commode and using a sliding board. It's like a, it's a rectangular board and it goes, it bridges the patient. So if the person's sitting in the wheelchair, they move the wheelchair right next to the commode. They put the little sliding board underneath their thigh and then they scoot across the sliding board until they get to the toilet commode. Okay. Um, so that's, if, if the person is not using a prosthetic devices and they're bilateral, that is one way that they can get there. Yes. I've had a lot of men who said that they use the urinal. You know, uh, one gentleman said that if he knows he's going to someone's home, that it's difficult for him to use the bathroom because the toilet is too low or any, it's too cramped a bathroom, then he has a urinal and he uses, uh, he uses it in the car before he, he goes into that person's home. Liz says, Jeff, I hope you have a peer visitor to help you on your journey. Yeah. Susan says, it isn't phantom pain, it's in my stump. So in that case, Susan, it's residual limb pain. Okay, so that makes it a little clearer. Um, Susan, if you want to message me some more details about that, and maybe I can help you puzzle that out. Um, Steven says, I treat myself like a four-year-old. I pee in a urinal in my cart before I go in anywhere, needed or not. Uh, Jess says, as a bilateral myself, I ambulate with my arms. I'm able to get to the commode and, and go. Let's see. Jeff says, physical therapy is coming to my home to walk through bathroom, bed, recliner, uh, and car, trying to cover all obstacles. And that definitely, Jeff, show that physical therapist every nook and cranny of your house so that they know what adaptations need to be made and even just getting the house ready for you to be able to come home because you know we all know sometimes these adaptations can take their time. Um, so when I was working home health, my priority was 
making sure the bathroom was accessible and safe. And usually that involved pulling out uh, the throw rugs and all the different trash cans and trash bins that people would have in their bathroom and <laughs> taking everything out. And then making a clear path between the bedroom and the bathroom. So again, getting rid of the throw rugs, getting rid of any clutter, any potted plants that might be in the way. And then also from the bedroom into the kitchen so that the person could join their family for dinner. Uh, let's see. Jess says shower. It's been more difficult to use shower chairs as a bilateral. Currently waiting my wheelchair, but have a lifelong experience without any adaptive devices except my prosthetics. That's amazing, Jess. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Ashley says, I went to go visit an aunt this summer. Her guest bathroom only had a shower and not even big enough for a shower chair. And the main bathroom had an extra deep tub. Ooh, right. So I used the shower and would sit on the commode, then crab walk a few steps to the shower and just sat on the shower floor, then repeated the process to towel off and dress. Um, and sometimes in those cases, Ashley, I sometimes tell folks if you can get a walker, if it's like a really small uh, shower stall and you can't fit a chair in there, um, it's sometimes you can fit a walker. So you can use the walker for support as you stand on one leg or, and it's a little messier to do this, but you know, you got necessity is the mother invention. If you put the chair facing into the shower, okay, so you'd have to have the shower door open and you'd have some water spilling out, um, but at least you can push the chair in as far as you can and then just sit on it that way. So I've seen that done. Susan says, I'm sometimes so scared of being an amputee because there's so much to know. I've been an amputee six years, but still definitely learning. And it seems so much to learn and it's scary to me. Um, and Susan, it's a lifelong journey. And it, it, it certainly is a lifelong journey of healing and of learning. Um, and I think that is one of the uh, beautiful things of having social media platforms where we can really expand our reach and people that we know that are in a similar situation to us and can provide um, different ways of solving the same problem. All right, Casey, let's see what Casey has to say. Casey says, this is not again, this is not safe for me personally in the shower. I do not use a shower chair. I stand up on the shower the entire time. It's definitely a balancing act and I have almost slipped a few times, but every shower chair I have tried is either too big or feels too big or unstable for me. Begin cozy laughing. <laughs> begin cozy lashing. <laughs> no, Casey, I'm not going to give you a lashing for that one. Again, guys, you, you know, you, you have all your textbook ways of, of managing a particular activity. And it, for me as a therapist, and, and this, this is definitely a big change from where I was 18 years ago, and I was too scared to think outside the box 18 years ago. For me, it's if you're thinking outside the box and you found a way to make something work for you, as long as it's safe, as long as it's safe, do it. OK, just with the understanding that what works for you, not necessarily going to work for the person next to you kind of thing. And, yeah, there's definitely a couple of people I know that they choose to do their shower standing up on the one leg and they have their little ledge. Like they, it might be like just a little tiny ledge in the shower that gives them that they can lean on just a little bit and give them just enough relief um, <laughs> to help out and get them through that shower. Um Let's see, Steven says adaptations can be tough. I just had two baths done in Italian marble. I'm not putting in permanent grab bars in that expensive material. <gasps> Suction cup bars work, but need to be checked daily. Yes, definitely, Steven. I mean, I, I get your I, I get your hesitancy to, to put grab bars in such a beautiful um, stone, but with those suction cup bars, you really need to be very careful and make sure that they are being installed properly. All right, some of these great comments, guys. Thank you so much for interacting this way. Okay. All right. Let me go to this next question because I thought it was kind of interesting. I had never seen this one before. Oh, Y'all got me talking. All right. This one was one I ran across in one of the amputee support groups. It was a picture of a particular device. And I was just like, wait, I haven't seen that in a long time. So this particular device is a harness that hangs from the ceiling in a clinic, right? And the person is placed in the harness with the idea 
that it supports their weight while they learn how to walk. And a, one, of the, one of the people on the support group said, has anybody used this? Okay. And there's different brand names. There's different companies that make it. I know back in the day it was called Lightgate, L-I-T-E gate. Um, and we used it a lot in the pediatric unit. So has anybody, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anybody seen one of those in either their physical therapy clinics or their prosthetist clinics? Susan said, I was in a harness. And again, this is definitely a very opinion, very subjective based thought process, okay? You line up 10 physical therapists and prosthetists, you're gonna get 10 different answers on their thoughts on this particular advice device. And I'm just gonna share with you my own professional experience with it. And again, everybody does things a little bit differently. Um, I personally, when it comes to working with amputees, I have never used one of these harnesses before. I have used the harness back when I worked in pediatric units. Uh, I used them when I was working with uh, children with cerebral palsy, sometimes even with spina bifida, children who had a lot of spastic tone. They had really tight, tight spasms and we would use this device. Uh, sometimes in the spinal cord injury inpatient rehab unit, especially if we had someone like a quadriplegic who was starting to get back some of that motor function, right? So we'd hook them up in that harness and pitch them up to the ceiling and, and, and start working with them that way, sometimes with a treadmill underneath to help facilitate that gait pattern. Hang on, let me see what you guys are saying here. So Casey says, yes. Steven says, I've seen them. Lynn says, yes. Glenda says, I've seen one. Susan says, in the hospital before they, oops, before they knew I could not walk, they would put me in the harness. Uh, let's see, Andrea, there's my occupational therapy. Andrea, you've been hiding on me. Ooh, you've been hiding on me with all the bathroom talk we were having. Girl, I need your input on this one. Uh, Andrea says, we used to have a light gate, right? <laughs> Showing our age there with that one. Uh, let's see, William says, used a lot in clinic learning, worked well for me. Uh, Ashley says, I've seen my PT office use the harness with little ones with cerebral palsy to help transition them from wheelchair to walker. Um, and yeah, guys, sometimes, again, with, with the kids, you know, when you're working with kids with cerebral palsy, it's like you don't have enough hands. Like you need you need to be an octopus because you need a hand here to stabilize here and you need another hand here to stabilize this. And then you need this hand here to make sure that they're not spasming up on you. you need, so sometimes with the light gate, it gives you that extra pair of hands. So light gate's holding them up so that you can focus on what you need to facilitate for their gait pattern. With amputees, and, and this is something that crossed my mind when I was first learning to work with amputees, you know, I realized the body learns better when it's doing the work itself. And I know it sounds kind of like a cop out, but I personally don't like to use this with amputees. I think you can learn better if you are being given proper gait training foundational techniques and that you are being progressed accordingly. Okay. So a lot of people were like, well, this is for the person who is not able to stand up on their own at all. And they haven't stood in five years. And I go, well, I don't know if putting them in a harness and strapping them up to the ceiling is the best thing to do if they haven't walked in five years. Okay. There's a lot of things to do beforehand to prep them little by little so that they can get to that point on their own. And in doing so, they're going to strengthen themselves better in the process. Okay. Now, are there certain cases where as a therapist, we have our physical limitations? Yeah, you know, I've had some patients who are three times as big as I am and they are bilateral amputees and they're not in great shape from a functional mobility standpoint. So that can present a huge challenge as to how do we get these patients moving, right? Aqua therapy, that for me, and again, this is my personal professional favorite, aqua therapy. And it worked beautifully for kids with cerebral palsy. It worked beautifully for spinal cord injury patients. And I think it works beautifully sometimes for amputees, provided that their prosthesis can go into the water. Okay. So again, and I'd be curious if I have any other clinicians on board, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Because again, do I think there's anything wrong with using one of these harness systems to teach an amputee how to walk? I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it. I just think there's other ways that are a bit more effective at teaching the gait training and teaching those mechanics. But again, those are my thoughts. This is where I tell you guys, that's my pure professional opinion. 
<laughs> All right, let's see what else. Uh, Gregory Gatson walked in one of those harnesses, I think, in the movie Battleship. Wow, let's check that out, Heidi. Um, Stephen says, I declined. I needed to learn balance and I accepted I would fall in therapy and that's why I was there. And again, you know, learning balance, learning how to walk, there's, there's so many ways that as therapists, we are trained to teach you this without falling. <laughs> so... Uh, let's see. Ashley says, I've seen my school's physical therapist use them for the same reason. So you see it, it, it a lot, definitely in the pediatric population, a lot in the neurologically involved population. OK. Uh, let's see. Jeff says, I've seen bilaterals and quad vets use the harness around a big room in videos. OK. And then the other thing, guys, and this is just like, you know, me nitpicking at this point. But with these harnesses, you know, in order to really support that person's weight, this harness is digging into them. I know some of the kids didn't like this harness <laughs> because it would just kind of dig into all the wrong places. And in some ways it can actually limit the mechanics of what you can do and it's limiting your range of motion. So, uh, you know, Liz says we use it at rehab. Okay. Uh, Susan says the harness was to pick me up and put me on a treadmill scary. Yeah, it's a little scary. Uh, Andrea says now have the treadmill system and a ceiling mount and track system. So yeah, Liz is like, yep, with the aquatic therapy. Uh, Valerie says as a physical therapist, I agree with you. I like progressive weight bearing and starting in parallel bars as opposed to harness systems. And again, guys, so you're going to see already, we have a couple of clinicians here. Some people say, yep, we're using the harness. And some people say, nope, we prefer to do all manual. Um... <laughs> Benny says they have one in San Antonio VA hospital was going to use, but never got used to it. And again, guys, even, even in the cases, um, even in the cases where, you know, you could potentially argue the use of a harness for teaching an amputee how to do gait training. For me, I would save it for the, you know, like I said, some of the more uh, complicated cases, you know, cases where, um, it's a bilateral amputee who's having a lot of difficulty getting that initial mobility started. But like I said, even then, I, to me, I just think of all the other things we do beforehand to prepare them for it. Uh, correct. Ashley says, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see the harness helping with a person's core. You know, and again, that, that's kind of like the trade-off is, you know, the, the, some people with the harness, it means that they get to start actually moving those legs without that fear of falling. But yeah, you're not going to be activating the core because the harness is kind of doing that for you. And it does interfere with some of those mechanics. Guys, don't go to your therapist telling them I said not to use it, okay? <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> I don't want any angry PTs calling me tomorrow about this. No, but guys, again, it's 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 one of those things where it's a tool that we that is available to use. It's a tool that's available to use. Uh, Leanne says, aquatic therapy with no device is what got me upright and work and and works the cardio as well. And again, when you're in that aquatic environment, you're obviously taking the weight off, but the body is still allowed to do its normal body mechanics. For me, I'm a huge fan of aqua therapy. And I've seen some of these therapists who specialize, they go on to specialize and that's all they do. They do aqua therapy all day. And I'm like, good gravy. They get their patients doing some amazing things in there. Amazing, amazing, amazing things. Um, Let's see. Lynn says, agree may interfere with transfemoral mechanics, like you said, Cosi. Yeah. And guys, even when we use them in pediatric patients or with stroke patients or traumatic brain injury patients, there would come a point in time where we'd have to take that harness off and rip off that Band-Aid and they'd have to learn to accept that weight on their own. So the work still needs to be done either way. All right, guys, I got one more thing here. One more question. Ah, this one. This actually came to me from a future physical therapist. Um, and I love it, guys. I'm, I'm having some more PTs send me questions, and I really enjoy this. Uh, before I get into this next question, guys, you know I got to put in a plug here. Uh, I am trying this year. I've got big plans this year for the show, big plans of where how I want to grow Cozy Talks and provide more, res more resources for you all. Um, and part of that includes expanding the YouTube channel. And those of you who have been watching me, I've got a couple people watching me from the YouTube channel itself. I am broadcasting live both to the Facebook and YouTube channel. I know some folks are not real crazy about Facebook or they're not really comfortable manipulating Facebook and getting to the live shows. 
and it's easier sometimes to watch from a YouTube channel. Uh, so guys, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Every platform, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, it's all under Cozy Talks. That's it. Nothing fancy, just Cozy Talks. Uh, so please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and following me on Instagram. This allows me to grow these platforms and I can start producing more. I've got a whole series of videos that I'm getting ready to launch onto that YouTube channel and I'm so excited to do it. All right, let's get back. Ooh, Janie, good question. Janie asks, is aquatic therapy better to do with leg on or off? Uh, a lot of it will depend upon what is the goal of the aquatic therapy. Um, if you're doing just general cardio calisthenics, then may, many people prefer to have the leg off. And it also allows them to give their residual limb a nice stretch, especially those who have tight hip flexors in the front. Uh, some people prefer to give it a nice good stretch. Now, if you're somebody who has an aquatic leg, a leg that can go in the water, some people like to do that because they do get to practice that gait training and they get a nice little workout trying to do those kind of exercises in there. Susan says, we'll try aqua therapy, have not tried it yet. I will ask my amputee specialist. And again, looking towards, especially in the bigger cities, you'll find at least one hospital that has a pool within the hospital. And that's really awesome because you know that there's gonna be a physical therapist that goes with that pool. That's kind of cool. Uh, Barbara says, water aerobics was the first activity I returned to after my above the knee amputation, balance and stamina and fun. I agree. I agree. I used to, you know, I belong to the YMC, the local YMCA, and I love watching the water aerobics class. I'm just like, what a fantastic way to do the exercise for, for anybody, actually. Uh, Valerie says, I did have success with the harness over the treadmill with a kiddo amputee that wasn't able to get the running technique until he was partially unloaded. And again, sometimes Valerie, I, that's a fantastic example of, of a great way to use that particular harness. Um, especially with the children, if you want to kind of just take a little bit of that fear factor away and just let them try it, um, especially with the running. Yeah. And on a treadmill, Ooh, lots of moving parts. Uh, let's see. Steven says, Pebbles, my dog loves your show. <laughs> Gets me to sit still for an hour and pet her. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, I'm glad to help out Pebbles. <laughs> okay. So guys, here's the last question for the evening. And John says, I just graduated in May with a bachelor's degree in pre-physical therapy. And just this week, I was accepted to a master's degree program for prosthetics and orthotics. I have a huge background in yoga and martial arts, and I've loved your videos and your message and attitude. Thank you, John. And he says, do you have any suggestions or advice for me? Yes. Yes, definitely. First of all, congratulations, John, on finishing your bachelor's degree and going on into P&O school. You are going to be an extremely well-rounded clinician with having both the physical therapy background and the prosthetics and orthotics. Um, so I can tell you what I did during my, you know, uh, teenage years, high school years, undergrad, and then grad school years. Any opportunity you can do to get into any kind of patient setting, do it. <laughs> It involves a lot of volunteer. It involves a lot of getting up early on your Saturday morning to go to help out at a free clinic sometimes. But anytime you get the opportunity to get your hands into a clinic, do it. And as many different clinics as you can. Believe it or not, when I first started out as a physical therapist, I was determined to be a pediatric physical therapist. You couldn't have told me that I was going to be an amputee specialist. I wanted to work with pediatrics in, with children. But I also knew in my training and in my education that I needed to give myself as well-rounded um, background as I possibly could, okay, in order to better serve the pediatric population. And lo and behold, plans changed in my life, right? But when it comes to learning this particular craft, whether you're becoming a prosthetist or whether you're becoming a physical therapist, get into wherever you can, okay? And fortune favors the bold. You know, a lot of times I would get to work in these ICU units and in these hospitals and even getting to observe in the OR as a high school student, just because I asked and I would go introduce myself into to the to the head of the department and say, this is what I want to do. Do you have a spot for me that I can volunteer? Is there anybody that I can shadow? OK, so, John, and certainly if you if you run into a clinician who wants to teach learn everything you possibly can from that clinician, even if it's not necessarily the specialty that you are looking at, okay? The second part is you have a, with your background in martial arts and yoga, adaptive sports are a wonderful thing that are, that, that are blooming everywhere, even despite COVID, 
you know, we're starting to see adaptive sports come more to the forefront, right? Use this to your advantage for your patients, your future patients, okay? There's a lot, you know, I, I, I did grad, undergrad and grad school in Miami, and we had a wonderful sailing program right on the marina in Coconut Grove. And they were, they were these specially designed kayaks that were made to be able to allow quadriplegics and paraplegics to do kayaking, okay? So once a month, the physical therapist students would get to go out and volunteer and help with the transfers and help, help these people learn how to use the kayaks. So now we have just so many more of these programs that are always needing an extra pair of hands, John. So I would spend my time finding that and then seeing how you can use your knowledge with yoga and martial arts to even potentially create a program for your future patients there. There's a lot that you can do with your degree. And then the more I get into my career, the more I think, okay, you know, how can I use my skills as a physical therapist and think outside the box and do something that's different, not be afraid to, you know, kind of break the norms and I don't know, do something crazy like a talk show once a week. Okay, but how can you use those skills that are unique to you and serve your patients with those skills? So yeah, Sportable, thank you, Harsh. And in Richmond, Virginia, you have this amazing organization called Sportable. And yeah, can't say enough wonderful things about all the adaptive and technology that they provide and lots of volunteers, lots of volunteers, right? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, so I think for tonight, guys, as always, if I missed your question or if I missed your comment, it was on accident, please forgive me. Uh, and feel free to send me that message or that question through my email. You can uh, do it through my uh, my website at www. Hang on, we're gonna just type it in there, www.cotitalks.com. See, my tech team knew they had to make it easy for me. They had to make everything cozy talks, otherwise I wouldn't be able to find it anywhere. Uh, Johnny, thank you so much. Thank you guys for, for joining me this evening and for allowing me to be a part of your lives this evening. Uh, guys, stick around for next week. Start sending me those questions so I know what I'm gonna talk about for next week, anything you guys want to hear about. And this includes my therapists out there. Thank you guys so much for sharing your clinical experiences on this show. It is so valued. So uh, thank you to those that participated this evening. All right, guys, as always, thank you for letting me be a part of your lives. I will see you, same that time, same that channel, next week. God bless, guys. Bye.